On this podcast, I try to take the challenge to walk through the emotion of anger. So you might have some strong feelings about this one, and that's okay. So check it out. If you're like me, you know your mind can be your best or your worst friend. Our mind is an amazing tool that can do incredible things, but our mind can also create problems out of nowhere. Sometimes our mind keeps recommending the same solutions to problems even when they aren't working. I see this pattern play out as individuals try to overcome their anxiety, depression, or even struggles with pornography, using approaches that make sense but aren't very helpful. This podcast will show you how real researchers and clinicians are changing the way we approach mental health and reveal helpful research supported principles designed to help real people with real problems. My name is Dr. Cameron Staley, and welcome to the Life After Series Radio. All right, it's time to review our next emotion. Let's take a stroll with anger. This is often one that is loaded with so many associations and judgments. That This can be a really challenging one to navigate, so I want to spend some time with anger. So this is, once again, coming from Marsha Linehan's Dialectical Behavior Therapy where she breaks down emotions, helps you recognize what are other emotions associated with these primary or core emotions, what events, events prompt these feelings, and then what about our interpretations that happen inside our minds that can further prompt these feelings. And then emotions are biological events. They are things that are impacting and changing our body. These are not things that we can just choose or switch emotions rapidly because these are impacting our body. How do we express these emotions? And then what are the after effects that tend to linger for a while? So let's start with a review of some of the different variations of emotion that, of anger that we commonly think about. So aggravation is another one. This might be a milder form of anger where you're just aggravated that you have to wait in traffic. And you can feel yourself kind of fuming, getting up there. You may not be cursing or honking your horn yet, but you're feeling that aggravated. Another one could be agitation. So if you're feeling kind of on edge. Another mild one is annoyance. That might be one that we experience maybe more than we think. I find myself feeling annoyed with technology pretty quickly. So annoyance shows up anytime. I'm trying to load a web page or connect um, with an application and it takes like more than two seconds. I feel myself getting annoyed even though that is so short. Like whenever technology doesn't do what it's supposed to do, I feel annoyed. So that is a variation or kind of a form of anger. You may also experience bitterness. So that often lends itself to a memory from the past or in regard to a specific relationship. Exasperation. Frustration. That is a term that I often ban when I'm doing therapy um, with clients. It's probably like the most common emotion word I hear is, I'm frustrated, I'm feeling frustrated. And I finally like banned it. Because often when we say that we're feeling frustrated, that tends to be an umbrella term for several different emotions. And it may not be that you're frustrated, it might be that you are angry, that you are livid, or it might be that you are really sad. So I found that sometimes we use frustration as a catch-all term to describe several different emotions. But what often I see is people use the term frustration when really they are feeling quite angry. And it's like a more socially acceptable variation of that feeling, but it also doesn't quite hit the mark of the reaction that somebody's having. So what I found is people that label the emotion of anger as frustration tend to have a harder time managing that anger. So you can feel frustrated, like that is an emotion, but oftentimes I found that it's something else. That one tends to be overused quite a bit. Other intense variations of anger are fury or wrath, rage, feeling vengeful, hostility. 
those can be really strong, intense versions of anger where we may feel out of control. And that may be directed towards ourselves, towards objects or people in our life. Other milder forms could be things like feeling grouchy or grumpy, irritated. Those might be some ones that are a little more subtle that we might kind of brush off and just call it frustrated. All those are variations of anger. And the challenge that I've come across when I'm working with somebody and they're either feeling angry or calling it frustrated or struggling with feeling okay with the anger is there are a lot of kind of connotations associated with anger. And some of that comes from a religious context where I hear a lot of folks kind of have been taught that anger is bad, that anger is sinful, um, that you shouldn't be angry. And we have a lot of research that suggests that individuals who are unable to identify and express the emotion of anger in a safe way, that anger kind of gets turned inward and may contribute to feelings of depression. And that might be more true with women who are often socialized that anger is an unacceptable emotion. It's not very ladylike to be angry. And so women may be a lot more likely to hold on to that feeling. And that may be part of the reason why we see higher rates of depression with women is they've kind of been taught that it's not okay to be angry. Um, whereas men are kind of taught, yeah, go ahead and hit stuff, be angry. But that's not a great way to manage anger either. Um, we have research looking at that. Like it used to be like, yeah, if you're angry, just go punch something, hit something, break something. And that doesn't really quite satisfy that emotion. Anger is a very activating emotion. So when we look at the neurological patterns with different emotions, they do different things. Things like happiness is relatively neutral, but anger is an activating emotion. It's compelling us to do something. So if we are constantly trying to shut it down, it's going to contribute to things like depression. But often anger is evidence that there is an investment in an outcome or a situation or a relationship. So feeling annoyed with your partner or exacerbated or grumpy or angry or bitter may not necessarily be a bad thing in relationships. I think when I do couples counseling and I've got a couple that comes in and they don't have any fights anymore, there's no conflict, there's no anger, there's just apathy, there's indifference. That's a relationship where there may not be a lot of investment or connection anymore. But having conflict or being annoyed or angry at times those could be like, yeah, this is a relationship that matters that you're wanting to work towards. So sometimes people kind of link a few different things together here. I hear often people say anger is bad, anger is destructive. And what they mean by that is maybe aggression or violence. That when I'm working with a couple and I always ask them, you know, is there any aggression or violence in the relationship? And if they say yes, there is, I've been hit or I've hit my partner or I've shoved them or held them down. I have a chat with them and like, well, you know, maybe this isn't the best time to engage in couples counseling because my goal with the two of you would be to put down some of your walls and be able to express your emotions more openly. But if there's violence in the relationship, that might not be a safe time to do this. So for me, violence is different than anger. I can feel angry and not punch a hole in the wall, or yell at somebody, um, or be physically aggressive towards other people. So that's an action, that's a behavior. Violence and aggression, those are actions. But the emotion of anger can be something that you can share, and that can be pretty helpful to understand that, you know, when you said that, or you did that thing to me, I felt really angry. I'd like to talk about that. You can be pretty heated, and yet communicate that. That's a more healthy way to process that. Some people that I've found that have experienced abuse or traumatic events in their life tend to struggle quite a bit with anger, especially if they've been the victims of people who have been very violent or aggressive. They may be more on the passive side, and anytime they start to approach what I would call assertiveness, 
they often feel like that they're being angry or that they're um, being violent towards somebody else. And so it's helpful to get some feedback on where you are in relation to anger. Because I've worked with many people where I'm saying, okay, let's, let's practice like requesting something from a family member or a friend. They're like, but that sounds so angry. It's like, no, asking them to call you back because you needed to have that talk is assertive. But it seems so demanding. It's like, no, nope, that, that's just assertive. Um, not making that request may be a little bit more passive. So sometimes anger can be challenging to understand what's an appropriate level to communicate versus what's too little where you're probably not going to get your need met. If you tell people, I was really frustrated when you did this, you might get dismissed a little bit more. Um, but also if you fly into a rage, um, people may have a hard time listening to you as well because that might feel unsafe. So finding that appropriate way to communicate this emotion, which can be really intense and quite consuming, is going to be really valuable. And so with anger, what I found is sometimes I'm not a very angry person, but there's things that will definitely get me going. I've discovered any type of social injustices, any groups of individuals that are marginalized or not able to have the same rights of others, that fires me up. And there's times that I may not be able to have a productive conversation with somebody while I'm in that state, that I may need to slow myself down, calm my body because I can feel that anger kind of building up. And that shuts down our frontal lobe, which is our ability to reason and take perspective and regulate emotion and have an adult conversation. So there's times where it's like, I need to take a break and come back to this. And what that looks like for me is I'll say, I'm feeling really angry. I feel like I'm not able to have this conversation now. Let's come back to this. And that may be all I'm able to say until I'm able to think through this, let some of the other emotions come up and process that feeling and really settle down before I can have that chat. So let's talk about some of the events that may occur that may prompt feelings of anger. So one of the top ones is having something that you really want in your life blocked. So you're not able to access that. So if you're really passionate about your career or your job and you get fired, you're not able to continue working there. Or this may be a relationship that you really care about and they ghost you or they break up with you or they stop contacting you. Any of those things may be like, wow, that was something that I really cared about and now I can't access that anymore. So really any goal, it could be not getting a financial aid if you wanted to attend college or it's like, wow, I don't qualify, now I'm not able to pursue my degree. It may be access to basic health care or equal rights or housing, you name it. So having any goal in your life blocked that is significant and meaningful, it's a pretty normal reaction to feel anger about that. One that gets me going, and this is my social justice part, is feeling like someone you care about is being attacked or threatened by other people. And I find this shows up for me even within my family. Like I've got little kids and they're just being little kids, but if they ever act disrespectful towards their mother, my wife, um, I get pretty heated. Like I, I just can't tolerate that level of disrespect towards somebody that I really care about. Um, same thing if I have other friends that I care about or even clients that I'm working with and they're telling me stories about things that their parents said or their partner or their own children. I can get pretty fired up because that's somebody that I care about. Um, but if somebody is attacking somebody you care about, that can really evoke um, those feelings of anger. So often I experience that more in sports where if my kids are playing soccer and there's some kid that's maybe kind of a bull in the china shop when you get in those little scrums and my kid gets knocked over, I can feel that kind of anger surging. Um, but I don't rush onto the soccer field. I just notice like, Ooh, yep, that's your kid, you care about them, you're into this game, and that felt pretty messed up. Um, or same thing, some of your favorite players might get some unfair calls from the referees. You might feel anger. You might feel like somebody is being threatened. Other ways that may feel a little more personal is anytime you're feeling oppressed, 
where you don't have power in a situation or you lose status or someone disrespects you. A really common normal reaction to that is anger. Not having things turn out as you expected or one that happens to me when I get hurt. So any physical or emotional pain, you might react to that in anger. That's just kind of a defense. Where it's like something is hurting you, you might be anger, angry to kind of build up that defense and protect yourself. So those are really common events that elicit this emotion of anger. So if you're someone, it's like, it's not okay to be angry and I don't wanna be angry. It's like, well, you don't always get to choose that. Anger is a reaction to these types of events that we encounter in our life. Also with anger, there's a lot of things that happen internally that can also prompt this feeling. So one of the common ones is believing that you're being treated unfairly. So this is one that I see um, on social media. If you ever are brave enough to read the comment streams on pretty much anything, if you feel like your point's not being heard or you're treated unfairly, you're gonna see people being pretty angry. And I find that quite a bit with politics. Because I think people, and maybe an, an idealist here that, different political parties are trying to fight for different types of equality and fairness, and yet maybe they're just seeing part of the picture or one side of the coin. And so people, no matter what the political issue is, feel like they're being treated unfairly. And a really common reaction to that is, is being pretty angry. If you feel like you're being blamed for something or you're blaming somebody else, that's going to evoke that feelings of anger as well. If you feel like important goals are being intentionally blocked by other people, that's gonna bring it up too. Another one is the shoulds. So instead of accepting reality for what it is, believing that things should be better, that you should have more money, that you should be more athletic, you should be smarter, you should be happier, you should have more opportunities, you should have more pay raises, all those shoulds are gonna feel like, yeah, I'm being treated unfairly. And you just kind of end up shooting on yourself is kind of what they talk about with that. So if you notice should statements, that I should be better, that can be a form of self-criticism that just kind of evokes more anger toward yourself and people around you. Other ones that happen internally are rigidly kind of perceiving the world and events or if you have a disagreement with somebody or there's a misunderstanding, there's conflict, and you believe that I'm right, it doesn't matter, I'm right. So believing that you're right and really just kind of digging in your heels there, regardless of the issue, is probably gonna prompt those feelings of anger. Any types of judgments that something is wrong or unfair, it's probably also gonna ramp up those feelings of anger as well. But also ruminating about events in the past that caused anger. So thinking about conflict situations or where you were treated unfairly or were experienced racism or sexism or homophobia or whatever it is, those are gonna bring up feelings of anger. So there's a lot of events that occur outside of us that prompt those, but there's probably just as many events that occur inside of us that trigger those feelings of anger as well. And anger is one of those that is really important for survival. So there are some kind of evolutionary benefits to anger. So you're gonna see a lot of physical changes associated with that. So you might see your muscles start to tighten. You might be bracing yourself. Um, you might have your kind of jaws clenched or maybe even your hands clenched. You may feel your face getting hot or feeling like you're gonna explode. Um, some people are angry criers. So the tears come out, and it may be really difficult to stop when you're really angry. You may notice an urge to want to hit something or bang the wall or throw something, um, or maybe even to hurt somebody else. Those may be some really strong urges um, that are coming from a place of protection. And sometimes those are really valuable. Like if your children are being attacked and you're being attacked, I hope you'd feel some anger there and you'd want to defend yourself and people around you. Other expressions of anger. So this could be verbally or physically attacking somebody else. That may be how you express that. Um, threatening other people, breaking things, 
Um, you may be stomping around, slamming doors, or just walking out. Um, you may be really loud or sarcastic or start to swear. Um, you may start to criticize other people or even yourselves. There's a lot of people I work with where they experience a fair amount of anger, and yet nobody would know because that anger is never expressed outwardly towards situations or people where it probably would be a little bit more productive. That anger is turned inward, and you see just a tremendous amount of self-loathing and hatred and criticism. It's all directed inward. So I would say, yeah, they're having a problem managing their anger, but outwardly, people wouldn't really know that. So anger can go either direction, towards other people or towards ourselves. Um, you might also see somebody like clenching your fists or frowning or not smiling, having a pretty mean expression. And that's something that I've tried to work on for myself that I'm often kind of lost in thought and contemplating ideas and concepts. And when I'm doing that, I look like this. And I've had people kind of comment like, ah, gosh, what's wrong with you? Why are you upset? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm just thinking. It's like, well, you look kind of angry. It's like, no, I'm just, just thinking. So kind of being aware of your facial expressions, because we are kind of programmed to read other people's facial expressions to really determine if they're safe, if we can approach them or if we can avoid them. So if somebody's happy and smiling, we tend to put our guard down and approach a little bit more. But if somebody's got their brow furled and they look kind of growly, it's like, we're probably going to run away or be on guard and be careful. Maybe that's why we don't like clowns, where it's like, this is confusing. That's an abnormally large smile and a mask. Something's not right here. It might be just confusing for us at a really primitive level. I don't know, I'm making that up. Um, other things you might see somebody brooding or probably one that I do more than I'd like to admit is I withdraw. Um, when I'm angry, I don't, I don't lash out. I don't call names. Um, I'm not someone who swears is very profane. I don't have a lot of conflict or arguments in my life, but I probably do withdraw. Um, when I'm feeling angry, I probably tend to shut down a little bit more. That could be a way we're expressing that, is we're just removing ourselves from other people. Um, other expressions, um, you might feel red in your face um, or crying. That would be another expression of anger. And then anger, it's another one of those emotions that can have a long shelf life where it kind of hangs out for a while. And these are why. These are the after effects of anger. So your attention might actually be narrowed. That You're just focused on that thing that happened to you or that thing that that person said. So if you could maybe broaden your perspective or think about other parts of that person or experience, you probably would calm down. But anger is focusing you. It's channeling you, which could be adaptive in certain situations. Other times it kind of keeps you stuck. So you might only be attending to that situation that makes you angry. That's a really common after effect. Or you ruminate about that situation or about things that have happened to you in the past. And every time you start to think about it, you notice yourself getting angry again. I caught myself doing that the other night. And I can't even remember what it was. But I was laying there at night and just thinking about some events that didn't go well, I didn't like. It was probably having to do with morning basketball. Um, there's some people I love to play with and other people that they don't really call fouls when they foul people. And then if you are in their vicinity, they're going to believe that you're fouled. And that, that gets me going sometimes. Or the ball is clearly out on them and they're, they don't claim it. They don't take responsibility. And it's like, come on. Let's just have fun and play right. This is just for fun. Um, and sometimes I catch my mind like going back to those because they really bother me. Because I try to have a lot of integrity. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I try to have a lot of integrity when I'm playing sports. And that can be really challenging to do. And when people don't, that, that gets me angry. Um, so I found myself like ruminating about that and feeling angry. And I remember lying there thinking like, why are you thinking about this? Like that occurred like a couple of years ago. Like it's probably okay to let that one go. Like you could keep thinking about it. You could keep replaying that event. That event's not going to change. That person's probably still going to come to morning ball. And you're probably still going to torture them anyway. That's okay. Um, but yeah, you could probably let it go. Like, why don't you like change the channel in your mind and think about something else? 
Um, Cause I didn't really want to feel angry in that moment. There was really no need to, um, but sometimes my mind drifts back to those events. And I found just noticing that like, wow, I'm feeling angry and this is why. I'm gonna change that channel in my mind and think about something else. And that really did change my experience of anger in that moment. Um, other after effects of anger is you might imagine fur further situations that might make you feel angry. And I had that experience with uh, a neighbor that was really unsafe and really aggressive towards myself and other children in the neighborhood. And I found myself like preparing for situations in the future. Um, and that didn't feel good. Like I always felt on edge and I felt angry. And even after I'd moved away from that person, um, I would still like imagine those events to prepare myself. And it's like, you don't need to do that anymore. You don't even live in the same state as that person. Um, but that was such a profound experience in my life that it caught up my thoughts and I was still preparing for it. Um, so, so I started to recognize that and notice those times my mind would drift off there and come back to, yeah, it's normal. Some of those experiences were quite traumatic and quite jarring for you. It makes sense that you felt angry. You had a strong desire to protect yourself and your children and your lovely neighborhood that was wonderful until that um, grumpy, dangerous person moved into your neighborhood. And so just acknowledging that kind of helped me shift that forward. But that anger can be so strong that your mind kind of comes back to those events pretty readily, um, pretty easily. Other after effects of anger, it can be so intense that we might dissociate or kind of check out from ourselves or from our situation or from our body or even feel pretty numb. Um, the anger can be that intense that it can hang out for quite a while. So that's anger. It's challenging. And I've worked with a lot of clients that get pretty angry. And for the most part, I feel pretty safe um, because I found that as I'm able to let people express anger and I don't try to talk them down from it. I don't take it personal. I'm not trying to blame them or attack them or judge them. But as I listen to that and validate that, that, that anger kind of settles down pretty quickly. Um, but often our impulse is when someone's angry is to get kind of aggressive or defensive back and that can kind of ramp, ramp that up or escalate that feeling of anger. So I know it's a lot easier for me when it's in a therapeutic context and they're typically not angry at me, but sharing things in their life um, that cause more problems. Um, but I found that taking a step back and I check in with myself like, oh gosh, like this feels pretty scary right now. This person's pretty angry. And then I kind of remind myself that this is a safe place, what this person's talking about and staying present with that. Um, there are other times where I'm in the presence of people who are angry and it doesn't feel safe where it's like, wow, this anger is maybe turning into aggression or threatening or violence. And those are situations where I don't handle those on my own. Um, and that's happened professionally, but also in my personal life, where it's like, yeah, I'm gonna involve somebody else, um, a mediator or someone else that can be here. I'm gonna take a step back physically. Um, I'm gonna make sure I, I'm bringing in other people that can make sure that this stays safe and productive. So I'm okay to hang out if someone's expressing anger, but when things get violent or dangerous, I'm out. Um, that's not something I'm willing to risk myself or other people in. So the emotion of anger, yeah, pretty normal, natural. Violence, aggression, I have a pretty firm boundary there. Um, I'm not aggressive, I'm not violent towards people in my life, and so I don't have any tolerance back um, for that either. So if that is an experience that you've had where you've been um, abused or bullied or threatened um, or someone has been violent to you, um, those can be really troubling. Those can impact us for a long time. And those can be really important reasons to get support. And that might be from safe people in your life or friends or seeking professional help. That might be involving police um, or other protective services. Um, if you're not able to kind of navigate that on your own, um, because our physical health and our emotional health is really important. And violence, there's really no place for violence um, in relationships. But anger, yeah, we're going to feel it. Um, and that, that can be okay. 
So I found that there can be really healing ways to express anger, and there can be destructive ways. So as we understand the origins of the anger, things that are contributing to that, take the time to process that with ourselves and then share that when we are calmer um, with safe people in our life. That can be quite healing and quite productive. Um, but expressing that anger in a violent way, it, it doesn't really help um, that feeling of anger. It's really not a solution or an option. Um, the other thing I would say with anger is it can manifest in a couple of ways. So anger can be a primary emotion. So one thing I think about is any times our personal rights or boundaries or opportunities are violated, it's a pretty natural reaction to feel anger. That's just kind of the outcome of that. But I've also found that many people who maybe come in saying, I've got problems with anger, as I'm listening to them, anger is functioning more like a secondary emotion where they actually might be feeling hurt or scared or threatened or insecure or really sad. And those emotions can feel very vulnerable they can be very tender, very delicate. And so we may not want to fill those or share those with other people. So we kind of cover them up with the emotion of anger. So if anger is a secondary emotion, it's probably going to keep showing up until you can identify maybe what's underlying that emotion of anger. And many times it is pretty profound sadness or hurt or disappointment. And those can feel a lot more difficult to experience, where anger can feel powerful. But sometimes that's really not the emotion we need to be feeling. And I think about that a lot in couples contexts or relationship contexts, where if you're feeling angry frequently, there might be other emotions going on. And it can be a lot more difficult for a partner to say, I'm angry at you a lot. It's often a lot easier to hear something like, I feel really hurt when you said that or when you weren't there for me instead of I'm angry at you. So being thoughtful about what other emotions might be there underlying anger, I think is particularly important in this emotion. Those are my thoughts on anger. So recognize it is a natural emotion. There's not groups of emotions where these ones are good and safe and okay. And these ones are bad and negative and we shouldn't have. For me, emotions are neutral. They're trying to communicate something to ourselves and to other people. They're trying to help us understand safety, safety or to activate ourselves. And anger can be a really meaningful, connective emotion. But that is different than violence or aggression. For me, those are behaviors. Those are different things. So understanding anger could take some time and may take some professional work. So if you have a hard time managing anger yourself or have been the victim of somebody who's been pretty violent or aggressive, anger can feel pretty scary. And that may be a daunting one to kind of work through on your own. So professional help could be helpful to understand anger. Um, but I found it to be really valuable. And there's times I've worked with clients that have kind of been bullied or kind of used in relationships. And one of the goals we have is it's, it's time to feel some anger and get angry. And that may take some time to get there. And yet when they feel that and um, express that, I've seen a lot of healing um, and growth. And on the flip side where I have clients where it's like, I'm angry all the time. It's like, let's try something else then. Like what's underlying that? And eventually we often do get to those feelings of hurt and disappointment and fear. And that can be quite healing and satisfying. So anger is complex. It may take some time to understand what that's like for you. Um, it may take some people that you trust that are safe to help you understand that better. Um, but recognize that anger, it's an emotion, just like the other ones. So if you're feeling that, allow yourself to feel it non-judgmentally. Um, don't just hold it in so it kind of festers inside. But also don't take that out on other people. Um, just understand that and communicate that in productive ways. All right, hope that's helpful. There's anger. Hey, thanks for listening. Please remember to rate and subscribe. I know you might be facing some issues in your life or know someone who is. Issues like anxiety, challenges in dealing with emotions, or other compulsive behaviors like unwanted pornography. 
And I know it's tough to talk to people about problems. Difficult to stare those obstacles down that we face in life and to really know how to deal with them. It's hard to know what to say and when to say it. And then when that moment you finally reach out to family and friends happens, sometimes it falls flat. I haven't found many programs teaching effective strategies like mindfulness, how to improve relationships, and ways to address unwanted pornography viewing through research supportive principles. So whether you simply want to help with a problem like unwanted pornography, difficulty responding to emotions, or just want to understand the world of someone struggling with porn a little better, head over to lifeafterpornography.com and get in on the next training. There you'll learn the exact same strategies individuals addicted to pornography used to transform their lives by implementing principles from evidence-based treatment shown effective in research for reducing unwanted pornography viewing. You'll learn the secrets, the myths, the enemies to recovery, and the LAP framework for dealing with unwanted porn viewing that we call WAVE. If that's something that interests you, click the link in the description or just head over to lifeafterpornography.com. I'm Dr. Cameron Staley. See you on the inside.